Okay, I want to talk with you, I want to review with you general systems theory here because so much of what we're going to be talking about here will be better, I think, understood against a backdrop of general systems theory. Um, and I can't really think of anything that we'll be talking about that will be inconsistent with uh, the things that we're about to review here. So with that in mind, again, if you have questions, uh, feel free to bring them up as we, as we go through this. Okay. General systems theory has also been referred to as open systems theory, uh, or people just talk about systems theory. It's a relatively new phenomenon as an organized way of thinking, a, a, a deliberate, distinctive, identifiable uh, way of thinking about phenomena. Uh, a, couple, a couple of names come to mind. One, which is a great name, Ludwig von Bertalanffy. Have you heard that name before? Ludwig von Bertalanffy, a biologist who became aware as he was looking at at biological phenomena that there were certain kind of patterns that, that recurred again and again and again and he was a particularly in intelligent and learned individual and he recognized that these patterns that he was seeing in biology were also patterns that he had seen in chemistry or that they were patterns that he had seen in history. They were patterns he'd seen in mathematics, etc. And so rather than simply regarding that as a kind of a little aha experience, he began the effort to construct a much broader framework that would explain or be consistent with these patterns across disciplinary specific subject matter. Meta theory here refers to the role of systems theory as being kind of all embracing of being a, a way of thinking about phenomena that can be applied to a wide variety of disciplines or professions or activity or phenomenon, but that systems theory itself doesn't own the specific subject matter. Okay? Systems theory provides the framework. Systems theory provides insight into patterns and processes that are to be applied consistently across and within disciplines by people who are, who are competent within those disciplines and then they, they get to use their own concepts. So if you're a psychologist, hey, let's go back to Freud, all right? So he constructs the notion of a system of, of, of uh, the, the mind. Uh, the mind is what the brain does. Uh, the mind as, as the, the uh, ego, the superego, and the id, right? and then the different kind of processes that occur within that. Okay, well that's, that's an approach in psychology. Meanwhile, uh, somebody like a Neil Smelzer who's doing work on group phenomena and crowd and behavior uh, many years later in sociology is looking at norms, the normative structures that occur within collective behavior and how changes in the normative structure, the shoulds and shouldn'ts, that people think operate within a context begins to shape behavior. So he begins to construct his own little kind of circles of influences, systems and subsystems. One person's talking about matters of the mind, another person's talking about a riot. Very, very different kind of subject matter, different levels and types of concepts. But the fundamental structures are the same, the fundamental relationships across these categories of concepts remains constant. That's the effort here or the meaning behind the meta theory. It's itself kind of a subject matter free way of thinking but quite organized, quite systematic in and of itself. It is a way of organizing thought and I'm going to come back to this thing that we were talking about just minutes ago. This doesn't promise truth. Got that? This isn't a guarantee of truth. It is a way of organizing your thinking about you or the world around you. And it provides an opportunity for insight. But it's insight that's driven from a system's perspective. And that doesn't rule out 
insights or knowledge that might be gained from some other perspective. One of the things we're going to see with systems thinking is that it's the whole that becomes the primary focus for our perspective. And in fact, the history of Western science for hundreds and hundreds of years has been exactly the opposite of that. It's been reductionism. It's been taking something and then, how many of you had biology class in high school? You know where I'm going with this, don't you? Poor Mr. Froggy. You know, you know that day that you walk in there, you, we've all dreaded it, and there's that frog laying there, and you have, or you have to come up and pick the dead thing out of a bucket and take it down there, and you start pinning it into that bed of whatever it is, and then start cutting on it. Why? So you can now see its stomach. So you can now see its lungs. So you can now see its reproduction system. Believe me, I didn't want to see any of that stuff. I would have taken the professors or the teacher's word for it. But our way of, our kind of Western conventions of understanding phenomena is to take them apart, reduce them down. Systems theory is exactly the opposite. It looks toward building an understanding of the whole. Okay? But what are we talking about here? Ways of organizing thinking. Ways of providing for under some level of understanding. The one doesn't necessarily negate the other, they simply make different kind of contributions. Right. And very, very importantly, general systems theory is value free. It doesn't say something's better than the other. It doesn't even say that life is better than death or existence better than the alternative. It is. It describes a way of thinking about what is without making value judgments. But it doesn't, in a sense, reject or it doesn't make it impossible for us as individuals to impose our own value judgments. But we have to realize that it's us who's doing that. The, the value judgments are not being driven by systems theory king or systems theory itself. So let's just talk about some of the basic structures, basic concepts. All right? Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the system. All right. You've seen these concepts before, all right? Here, this denotes the focal system. This is going to be the thing we're going to try and pay attention to, if you will. Well, if this is the system, then things that are inside of it, if you will, inside the system, inside the boundary of the system, can be thought of many times as subsystems, subsystems. So the parts of systems, the essential parts of them, consist of, for the most part, subsystems. Oh, by the way, a subsystem is a system itself. Right? So this is kind of telescoping. We can go down, we can go up using the same set of concepts. We just kind of move everything up or everything down in terms of our levels. Is this a system? Yeah. So you system, it's the organizational system, okay? Here's group, it's a subsystem of the organization. But now let's move up. Here becomes now our system for this exercise. It's the inner organizational field. It's the task environment from your readings. And the organization is simply a part of the task environment. So that's a subsystem of it. Oh, but we'll keep on going. The group is a subsystem of the organization, which is itself a subsystem of the task environment. Let's go down one more. Let's drill it even down further. The individual is a subsystem of the group. The group is a subsystem of the organization. The organization is a subsystem of the task environment. Let's move it down several levels to the level of the group. The group is the system. The individual is a subsystem. If the group's our focal system, what's the organization to it? Yeah, the suprasystem, isn't it? So if our focal system is a group, then its relationship to the organization is to have a system to its suprasystem, right? Here's an even more encompassing system. I don't have a word for it right now, right? But that it subsumes the suprasystem. So look how, look how flexible that is. We've maintained the consistency of an approach to looking at part to whole to the environment within which the whole exists. There's going to be a word you're going to see in just a second 
that's a dynamic word that suggests that kind of flexibility and conceptualization. All right. So what's a system have? Well, here's an effort to kind of depict a system with the various parts of it depicted, right? Oh, and the lines between the parts. They're there consciously. Why? Okay. Because among the central characteristic of a system are these. There's continuity and structure. The, those words actually suggest one another. If there's no continuity, you don't have structure because structure refers to patterns. And patterns have to have some kind of continuity. They have to have some kind of consistency over time. So if we were to go back, if you will, here, the relationship across these different parts in order to have structure implied would have to have some consistency over time, which might be depicted as this. I don't know how to use smart boards well, so I have to be avoiding touching these things. Right? Notice that little cursor that jumps up? Anyway, this has a relationship to this, not just today, but probably tomorrow. That begins to speak of consistency, of relationships over time, or structure. All right? So the parts of an organization, excuse me, the parts of a system have structure. All right? Because there's structure there, a system isn't reducible only to its parts. Because we really have parts plus organization or structure. That's creating system. And system is also going to have those emergent characteristics that we alluded to last week. Example. Yeah. Does anybody know what the Red Green Show is? Has anybody heard of the Red you heard of the Red Green Show? Are you Canadian? Okay. It's a Canadian show. I think it's hilarious. My wife can't stand it. Right? It's on PBS and it's this great well, I think it's this great show, kind of set in the woods, the Canadian backwoods. Well, Red Green is the he's the central figure. So sometime within the last week or so, because we were just watching something that we T bowed yesterday. Um, he, he orders a Jeep for $75. And by the way, I remember these ads when I was young. They were actually in magazines and particularly comic books. You could buy a Jeep for 75 bucks. Now, 75 bucks back when I was young was, would cost a little bit more than, than now, but still, 75 bucks. Well, so Red orders the Jeep. Now, here I'm getting back to a systems theory lecture, actually. So here it comes. Guy brings in his box, tips it over, and out comes a bunch of parts. And Red says, what's that? He says, well, that's your Jeep. And there's 20 more boxes of Jeep parts out there in the truck. That's how he got his Jeep. It was all in pieces. Now imagine this. If a system were solely reducible down to the sum of its parts, when you emptied those 20-some boxes in your living room, and there's that pyramid of parts. Do you really have a Jeep? You got Jeep parts, but you know what you don't have? You don't have ride. You don't have acceleration. You don't have turning radius. You don't have braking force. You don't have carrying capacity. You don't have lumbar problems from sitting in those crappy seats that a Jeep would have from World War II. You don't have any of that kind of stuff. You know why? Because all you got is parts. Now you put those parts together in an appropriate way that's maintained over time. Ah, intended structure, right? Add some oil, add some gasoline, juice it up, and what do you got? You've got a Jeep, and you've got, in addition to that, those emergent characteristics that, have, that come with having a system whole that's a Jeep, and that has to do with ride, miles per hour, uh, miles per gallon, all that kind of stuff. So the whole is more than the sum of its parts, just like that is in fact different from this. If I had 10 of these, or seven, or however many the number was, but no lines across them, if we just had parts in here, 
They could just kind of do whatever they wanted to, jumble them around, they'll be in a new kind of configuration. We're not going to have a system because there's no relationship in there. There's no structure within there. That's the pile of Jeep parts. Here where we have structure, now we're starting to talk system. Okay? The parts of a system are also interdependent. Right? What happens if I move this part? Does this have an effect? This is what this If I move this out here, think of these as rubber bands. What's going to happen to the others? They're going to move too, aren't they? And they're going to move in systemic ways or systematic ways. If I move this out, and this is all rubber band kind of stuff, if I move this out, all right, and there's some level of inertia or there's some level of effort of keeping the kind of system properties that's built into these relationships, we might see, see some kind of resistance. We might see other parts that are relatively weak kind of succumb to the pressure of moving this other one, while other parts that are particularly strong resist even more. We're going to see interdependence. We let that thing go, it kind of snaps back into place. We move another thing out, we'll see a different set of movements involved, but again, systematic in nature. And because systems seek, for the most part, well, part of, its, of the systemness is to maintain that kind of structure, we'll see efforts made to preserve the essential structure the essential, and the essential goal attainment of that particular system. Interdependence of parts. Now, along with interdependence of parts, there's a notion of multi-causality. Let's just pretend again that these are rubber band kind of things, but the systemness, the structure within the system, seeks this kind of order, all right? And if I move this out, we might find this moving too. Now, if you're looking right here and only right here, and then it's immediate relationships, you might not know that this was the prime or the initial cause. The proximate cause might be pressure here, or it might be pressure here, or it might be 60% pressure here and 40% pressure here that causes this thing to move. In other words, what starts as a single action may in fact transmit effects, causality, in multiple ways upon this right here, multi-causality. Now, if you think about that, that's kind of a mind-bender because the traditional Western reductionistic approach to causality posits a single cause for any single effect in any particular situation. All right? change the cause, you'll change the effects. For every different effect in a different situation, there should be a different cause. A single one that you can identify through whatever kind of causal model you have. But here is the notion in systems thinking of multi-causality. Simultaneous causality occurring from a variety of sources. That's, that's pretty cool. Yep, there we go. Systems thinking also posits an overarching goal for all systems. All right? Can you remember what that is? No matter what kind of system we're talking about, what's the fundamental goal of a system? Close. It, it actually is close. All right? And we're going to touch on homeostasis in just a little bit. Maybe help it. Homeostasis toward the end of homeostasis in service of something even more basic and even something more global. Survival. There you go, survival. The overarching goal of systems from this perspective is survival. So Christina, for example, we go back to the example or the, your experience in the organization, is that regardless of what persons in the organization claim its goal to be, even more important than that is that the organization continue to exist. 
And so a lot of times what you'll find in the political environment of communities and organizations is that people will claim one thing, but they will actually lead or influence organizations in another direction, and that other direction is toward ultimately encouraging its survival in ways that the other, the formal goals may not have provided for. Okay. And now, Holon, H-O-L-O-N. Holon's an interesting concept because a holon communicates the notion okay, that something is complete in and of itself. It is itself a system, but it's also a part of a greater system. A holon is simultaneously the whole and a part of something greater than itself. So we could refer to the subsystem. That's a whole on as well. When we think of it as a whole on, though, we think of it as the focal system, itself a part, the subsystem, of a greater, more encompassing system. All right, so here. Have you ever been, can you be appropriately thought of as a whole on? You as individuals, OK? Are you kind of complete in and of yourself? Are you an intact system? Yeah, yeah. Are you also a subsystem of something that's greater or more encompassing than you? Yeah, you're actually a subsystem of many more encompassing systems. What are some of them? Your family, okay? Oh, by the way, and it may be multiple families, right? It's your family of orientation, the one you grew up in. If you're married or you're involved in an intimate relationship, it's that family. Oh, by the way, and you're also probably a member of your, your significant other's family by extension, all right? Okay? What other family? What other more encompassing systems? What? Work. Your work groups? That's right. Your employing organization, different kinds of reference group or socialization and task groups within your organization. What else? Community? That's exactly right. Different kind of communities represented here, your citizens or residents in there, and, and neighborhood groups and, and, and associations within that. There's a real obvious one. School, that's exactly right, you know, in a variety of ways, MSW program, Department of Social Work, College of Arts and Sciences, ETSU, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we're, we can be thought of, we can think of ourselves as holons. Question so far? These things, these things pretty consistent with what you've understood as essential elements of general systems theory from the past? Okay. Is the whole on notion new? This is a question. That's frequently a term that isn't communicated earlier on. Yeah, yeah. It, that, again, most times students will not have been exposed to that concept. Okay? And then again, here's, here's the notion of the different kind of layers or hierarchies or how we might depict it, uh, where we have um, a subsystem of a system which is itself a subsystem of a grander system. And oh yeah, this could be a subsystem of a much more expansive system, on and on and on and on. Okay? This is another way to diagram that same thing. This is another way to diagram that same thing. See, this could be the individual. This could be the group. This could be the organization. This could be the inner organizational field. It's actually kind of a pretty picture, too. You know? It's kind of like pop art, but I actually, it does that, too. Yeah, yeah, it does that, too. Yeah, very much so, yeah. Kind of cool. Can you imagine how big that critter would be? I mean, if that's like Donald Duck, it's like huge. Yeah, see, here's this effort, too, to show. By the way, look familiar? Okay, ready for this? See, I don't know if you're aware of it, of how much by borrowing from general systems theory for that prismatic organization. Here I'm describing a prismatic organization. All right? Look at this. This is simply a way of depicting the different levels of, more in, of greater inclusiveness as we go from level to level, from least inclusive to most inclusive systems, and how each is embedded. Each layer is, in a sense, embedded in the other. And notice, if again, if we're using this kind of graphic for it, if, for example, this is our focal system, then it's embedded within a supra system here, 
This would represent conceptually, pictorially, the subsystems in it. And this comes as a unit. We move it up, we move it down, no matter where it is, the same relationship applies across these different kind of levels. Okay. And what this depicts is actually several things. But the thing I want to focus on right now is that so much of the time, systems as they relate to their environment are actually relating to other systems out there. Right? This has particular relevance, well, it has particular relevance for system theory. Huh? For this class, for this class, it would have particular relevance to, let's say, an individual relating to other individuals in his or her group. Or we might be talking about a group of individuals in an organization relating to other groups. Social work relating to psychology, relating to public administration, relating to history in the College of Arts and Sciences. Right. Or it might relate to an organization that's referring clients to a community hospital at the same time being monitored by a state agency and having its clients referred to it from a third agency. You see, agencies just don't relate to an environment willy-nilly, if you will. The environment has structure out there. And important elements, not all, but important elements of that structure are other organizations. But you know what? This could also refer to an individual. It could refer to a massive organization. It could refer to an entire community. The point here is that the system is relating to other systems within the environment. Number of people. We're not going to be able to get into too much of that in this semester, but one of the person's names, great name again, Sherry Terryberry, right? Did a lot of work with, yeah, I know it, with regard to uh, environments. And so she talks about, for example, an environment being turbulent it for human service organizations. That's really one of the characteristics of the environment of human service organizations. Um, th there's a lot going on out there. Unpredictable events in the environment that impact the organization in important ways. You know? In a rural environment, in a rural environment, the organizational environment for human services tends to be sparse. You don't have a lot of referral agencies that you can count on. You don't have a lot of agencies that are providing you with clientele. You might be the only shop in town for your particular clientele, for your particular services, et cetera. Now, you go to a large city, and it's a denser organizational environment. So, see, environments can, can vary by density as well. In a situation like that, we might have many, 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 many of these other kind of things. Basic concepts of systems. Anybody have any idea what this represents? Close. Very, very close. You're on the right track. What's that now? You're getting close. But let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. If this is the system, this is a system, do you see any output? Boing. Did that get out? Boing. Did that get out? See, it didn't get out. You see any inputs? Boing. See, nothing's going across the boundary, right? This is an effort to, to depict, depict a closed system. A closed system. You've heard that concept before. A closed system is a system with an impermeable boundary. Nothing gets across it. Nothing from the outside gets in, nothing from the inside gets out. Okay. One of the things about boundary while I'm at it, boundary always differentiates, this is by almost by definition, it differentiates what goes on inside from what goes on outside. Said differently, when you have a boundary What's going on inside a system is always different than what's going on outside of it. That's the purpose of a boundary. If you didn't have a boundary at all, 
or you had so-called quote-unquote boundary where everything that was on the outside could come in and everything that was on the inside could come out, where's the boundary? It defies the definition of a boundary, if you will, right? Oh, and by the way, if that were happening, how would you be able to differentiate this from that? You wouldn't be able to, would you? As if, say, that part of the water in this deep pool, well, that's the system and everything else is its environment. Huh? How is there anything different from this bit of water from the rest of it, the way you've defined it? It isn't. So there is no system there. That's chaos. That's mass. That's sameness. But here there's difference. This is different from that. Why? Because there's a boundary there, and that's keeping things from the outside out and just keeping things inside in. Now, in contrast to a closed system, all right, you have an open system. And an open system is one that has permeable boundaries. There have been times when I wanted to describe this and did it as semi-permeable, but that's actually kind of a, a wasted syllable. Because if everything comes in and everything comes out, you don't have a boundary anyway, right? And if it's permeable, it means some things can go in and some things can go out. Now here's where we have inputs and outputs, if you will, right? Some things coming in, some things going out, right? We breathe in, we breathe out. We breathe in, we breathe out, okay? <laughs> we take in food. You do the rest. Inputs and outputs. Right? Now, essentially what's going on here is that the system is requiring various kinds of resources from its environment. But its boundary permits it to import resources that it needs and to export what it doesn't need or what it needs to export in order to acquire what it needs. Important thing with an open system is that there's a transaction across boundaries, but a boundary still exists. Second thing is not everything that wants to necessarily can get in, and not everything that might be able to go out can get out. Okay. Now we'll go back to this kind of model. This should look very familiar to you from last week's class. As we ascend from least inclusive to most inclusive systems. So this we can think of as a system, although it's a subsystem of this. It's not entirely that. There are other things about that level of system, right? Here's the pile of Jeep parts, but when we put them in organization, we have performance that we didn't have when it was a pile. Performance is an emergent phenomenon, right? When we've got a bunch of Jeeps and we, have a, and we, and we move up to a, a broader system of transportation facilities, let's say, or transportation devices, then a Jeep is only one kind of thing like that. We've got trucks, we've got boats, we've got all kinds of airplanes and all this kind of stuff. We have other performance characteristics that are involved as we've moved up in a system of inclu inclusiveness. Continue to do that kind of thing. As we move up, Every time under systems theory, there are new phenomena, there are new characteristics that need to be accommodated. Now, the process of moving up is largely a process of synthesis. Synthesis. Putting things together, creating holes from things that we now see as parts of the whole. Putting them together in organization. This as well runs largely counter to the tra traditions, the dominant traditions of Western science. The dominant traditions of Western science emphasize analysis rather than synthesis. So what were you doing when you cut up froggy? Right? You were looking at smaller parts and how they related to one another and what their individual functions were. So that in the end, one plus one plus one plus one could equal four. Well, I understand the biology of its reproductive system. I understand the biology of its endocrine system. I understand the biology of its respiratory system. Well, there's one plus one plus one. So now I'm at three. 
So all I have to keep doing is looking at the separate systems and in the end, under analysis, I add that stuff up. So the sum, the whole becomes in effect the, the sum of its parts. But with synthesis, what you're trying to do is put these conceptual pieces, these conceptual systems together in new and creative ways that have a structure to them. And then what arises from that? What's a new level of understanding that we have? What's our ability to explain or predict based upon that new synthesis? That's a systems, that's systems theory thinking. Now, if we're talking about emergent phenomena, let's look at some examples of that, okay? Group norms develop above the level of the individual. If we're strictly staying at the level of the individual, not want to come back over here and look at this. Group norms have no place at this level of examination of phenomena. And by the way, you don't have to worry about take, taking word for word notes here. You're going to have this PowerPoint. It's, I'm going to make it available to you. All right? It's going to be a narrated PowerPoint, but you'll be able to stop it anytime you want to to take the notes or whatever. Okay? Organizational goals emerge above the level of groups. At this level, it's entirely appropriate for us to talk about group norms in a way that wasn't when we were here, right? But as we move up, we understand that there are formal organizational goals that don't apply at the level of synthesis here. Okay. Agency policies arise above the level of groups as well. The nature of the community needs rise above the level of the organization. Those are just examples of when you move up into more inclusive systems, there are things that are important to consider that aren't available to you before that point in time. Systems thinking pretty much requires that you think of the system in its environment. Have you heard the terms and the environment in the environment at all? person in the environment? All the time that you heard that, haven't you? That's a systems perspective. Absolutely fundamental to the way social workers are expected to, in turn, and in turn, probably do think about their work, the phenomena that we face. Okay, now, this is something that we didn't get into last week. There's kind of an opposite side. As we move up, in system from least inclusive to most inclusive system level, we're encountering emergent characteristics. But there's a force, there's a dynamic that works down. And it's referred to as the hierarchy of constraint. And basically what it means is this. More encompassing systems constrain the freedom of action of less inclusive systems. Give me an example of what I'm describing here in very general terms. Give me a specific example of that, and I'll give you a bunch of them as well. Broader, more inclusive systems constrain the freedom of action of lesser inclusive systems, less inclusive systems. And by the way, go ahead. exactly right. What you can spend that money for, right? Or in a kind of a Medicare thing, what you can do for which you can call down money for Medicare. Exactly right. Exactly right. right. I'll give you another example. We're doing it right now. We're doing it right now. As individuals in a class in a department of social work at ETSU, if you had your own head, would you be here right now, this very moment, listening to me drone on? And the answer to that, there's only one right answer, the answer is, yes, of course you. <laughs> but I'm lying now. The real answer, as we all know, is no, you wouldn't be doing that, right? Why are you here right now? You know why? Because you have to be, right? I mean, it really just boils down to that, doesn't it? Because you have to be. 
Why do you have to? By the way, same applies to me too, <laughs> okay? I would much rather be home sipping on a glass of wine, watching a rerun of the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> Absolutely truthful. Absolutely truthful, right? But the fact is that the same university that requires you to be here requires me to be here. I'm here because I have to be. You're here because you have to be. Our options, our freedom of choice has been constrained by a more encompassing system. And you might say, well, but I want my degree. Of course you want your degree. That's why you chose to enter the system. But once you entered the system, did you find your options restricted? What? Yeah, of course you did, right? Of course you did. Let me give you some more examples of that. Because all of us have a lifetime of such examples. As a child, did you ever find your freedom of choice, your freedom of behavior restricted by your parents? Yes, yes, that's exactly right, that's exactly right. And then as a parent, do you ever find yourself restricting the freedom of choice of your children? Yes. Bad parents, bad parents, but they, no, 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 right? Of course, system theory has, makes no value position about that. It's not good, it's not bad, it is, right? University requires certain levels of performance in return for academic credit, right? State requires certified professionals to engage in continuing education. Why am I taking this course? Because I thirst, I hunger for knowledge. No, because I have to, I lose my license. Now the other thing may apply as well, but that doesn't, that doesn't negate the fact that the broader system has that as a requirement and you must comply with that requirement. State laws restrict legal drinking. Passports required to enter a country, right? That broader system restricting your freedom of action, which might even be freedom of entry, right? Into that country. All examples of more encompassing systems restricting the freedom of action of less encompassing included systems Hierarchy of constraint. Okay. Now, I want to draw a distinction between, talk about change for a second, but I, the distinction I'm trying to make here is the distinction between change in a system and change of a system. That's the key. This panel here, or this slide, is an effort to depict change in a system. Now, think of the square box with four essential subcomponents as the system, all right? As defined, as I've just defined it, does this vary in any really significant way from this? This is a square box, this is a square box. That has four elements, this has four elements, all right? The order, the position of certain colored parts is different, that denotes the change that's taking place in there, but essentially the system is unchanged. Give you an example of that. This is actually supposed to depict the pendulum on a grandfather clock. It could also depict Mike Smith just standing up here and moving his arm. All right. All right. The latter is true as well. It's actually more true than the former. This is actually change in how I'm standing in some respects, but it's not changing my system at all. Right? A pendulum, a clock, a grandfather clock like this is different than a grandfather clock like that, but it's a change in the system. The clock is actually built to do that. The essential nature of a clock doesn't change, no matter how, where that pendulum happens to be. Now you take the pendulum off, throw it away. Now you're changing the system. You're not going to get the same performance out of a grandfather clock. Right? You take my arm off, you're, you're going to change my system as well. That was for illustrative purposes only. Pendulum swinging an old-fashioned clock. You replace an employee without unchanging any kind of job practices or expectations. Right? There's no change of the system. It's a change in the system. Chances are the system was built to accommodate such a change. And by the way, as a general rule for organizations, that's an essential element of long-term survival. That's an essential element of productivity, goal attainment for most organizations. That is that individual members of the organization can be replaced without changing the essential nature of the organization. 
that's much more likely for the lower participants of an organization than for folks at the highest levels of an organization. Okay. Anything that's of a cosmetic change nature, more likely a change in than a change of a system. Okay. And any of you watch the football games over the weekend on Sunday? Just one? Just one person has the courage to admit that you watched that? <laughs> okay, right? The fact is, is that there's a variety of plays, right? But the fundamental rules of the game weren't changed at all. From one play to the other, the fundamental rules of football remain constant. But you might not know if it was going to be a running play, if it was going to be a pass play, quick kick, or whatever it might be. Changes within the, org or within the system, but not of the system at all. Most changes that occur in human service environments are changes in systems rather than changes of systems. The more significant changes that organizations experience are changes of system, typically. Right? Said differently, changes that are solely in system are not systemic changes, really. They're not changing the system, they're just the levels of randomness that the system has already been built to accommodate. But changes of the system involve different policies, different programs, different structures. Those are more significant. Marsha, I see you sitting back there processing that. Have you ever been a part of an organization that created a brand new program in response to a newly identified need? Sure would be. Sure would be. Were there new people put in place, new people hired, new divisions created, new policies created, new procedures created? Yep, 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 yep. Uh-huh. It's exactly right. It's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again. Not, they're not good, they're not bad, they are. Kind of thing. So it's a, systems theory, from systems theory, we're not going to get those kind of evaluative uh, uh, judgments. Now here's an effort to depict a change of a system. All right? From a square system with four essential components over time, what we see is a pentagon arising and depicting a different kind of structure of events, uh, different uh, number of key components with a very different set of relationships within as well, right? Changes of a system. Uh, what are some examples? Introducing a novel program, adopting or pursuing new organizational goals, all right? All right. So on the one hand, I mean, you really were talking about, I got a sense from the urgency of your voice and the passion there, you're talking about something that's pretty significant for your agency. Right? So earlier we talked about maybe some ways of thinking about how that might come, ab come about. Here from a systems perspective, we're talking about how it, that's a, a different phenomenon than just a change within the system that the system was already built to accommodate. This may actually have more far-reaching kind of consequences, particularly if there are new structures that are going to be created or existing structures that are going to be eliminated or changed. If you eliminate a, a long-standing program, that's another example of a significant structural change, change of system. Right? When you have divorce and the dissolution of a family, right? something many of us have gone through, we've all seen this kind of thing happening. Think about how significant that is in terms of the life experience of people of what had been an intact unit, now physically perhaps separated from one another, economically separated from one another, socially, emotionally separated from one another, et cetera, right? But creating a family also represents a systemic change, you know? For any of those of you of, of us who've gone through that kind of thing, you know that, it's, that one plus one equals two, but when you add number three there, you know, now you got a different kind of family and you got a whole new set of relationships and expectations and stressors and, and thrills to experience, right? A new system has been created or a new type of system has been created out of the old. It's a change of system. Okay? So now what this shows us, 
is it's kind of it's a Venn diagram to remind us of the relationship of some of these key concepts. All right? This circle represents all systems. Some of those systems are closed, impermeable boundaries. Right? Some of those systems are open. And within the open system category, there are certain systems that can change their structure. We call, refer to these as complex adaptive systems. So if I were to ask you, true or false, all complex adaptive systems are open systems, what would you say? True, right? The question was, or the statement was, true or false, all complex adaptive systems are open systems. True. Right? If I were to say, um, some closed systems are complex adaptive systems, true or false? Yeah, it's false, right? How about all open systems are complex adaptive systems? False. How about all complex adaptive systems are open systems? See where we're going with this? All right? All complex adaptive systems are open systems, true, but not all open systems are complex adaptive systems. Some open systems are not complex and adaptive. From a biological perspective, from a biological perspective, can you think of an open system that's not complex adaptive? And I'll give you a hint. Look at the person sitting right next to you. Nobody's looking at the person sitting next to you. There you go, that's right. <laughs> right? The person you just looked at, from a biological perspective, is an open system that's not complex adaptive. Give you an example of what I mean by that. If this room were to flood right now, how many of you would grow gills? Right? We're all in a world of hurt because we don't have the complex adaptive ability to change our structure to accommodate that change in our environment. But do we eat? Do we drink? Do we breathe? Right? Inhale, exhale. Right? Do we take in information? Yeah, we do all those things so we're open, but we're not complex and adaptive. Now, just to get to where we're going to go in, in a little bit, do you think that organizations, particularly human service organizations, strictly speaking, are closed or open? Open. Mm -hmm. For example, where do they get their employees? Do they grow their own? No, they get them from the community, right, or from somewhere. Where do they get their clients? They get them from outside, right? Where do they get their money? Get it from outside. Where do you get your knowledge about technology, changing technology, for the most part, from the outside, right? See, human service organizations get just about everything they need from the outside, right? And then what do they do? What do human service organizations do with, with clients after they're done servicing them. Let them go back outside. Let them go back outside. That's exactly right. Yeah. Expel them back out into the environment, if you will. All right? What do you do about news releases, about good things that happen in your organization? Just keep them? Or are you trying to have them published on the outside? You send information outside, right? Sure. So human service organizations are open systems. Now, again, strictly speaking, do you think that human service organizations are also complex adaptive systems? Which is to say, can human service organizations change their programming, their structure, their priorities, their goals? Yes, yes. Human service organizations are included within what we refer to as complex adaptive systems. In fact, you ready for this? All human social systems are in fact complex adaptive systems. All human Social systems are complex adaptive systems. Families, groups, organizations, communities, nation states, international organizations and associations, all complex and adaptive systems. Some do a better job of being adaptive. Some are a lot more open than others. The United States is a lot more open 
than North Korea, okay? But still, North Korea is a complex adaptive system, right? It's listening to what's going on in the world. It's attempting to influence the world through its actions. There are inputs and outputs. It changes its policies over time. Now, how does that change? How can, what are some of the dynamics of this change that we're talking about? And here we're particularly talking about changes <coughs> of organization, particularly. There are two concepts that you already have heard about. I don't know how familiar you are with them. This one depicts multifinality. Let's break it down. Multi, many, right? In this case, two, plural. Okay? Finality, final point. So what this concept refers to, what this diagram attempts to depict, is that systems theory posits that a system at any point in time might or has the ability to change, if it's a complex adaptive system, into any of several eventual forms. I'll repeat it in a different way. If, you, if you're thinking about a complex adaptive system, then the notion that there's one and only one outcome that is possible for that system runs counter to this tenet in systems theory. Systems theory posits that a variety of outcomes are possible. And that's actually a, again, this is not a systems perspective value position. It's a Mike Smith value position. That's a positive thing. Because in effect it means that no matter how apparently hopeless the case from a systems perspective, Right? It's possible that there could be some level of success. That's always important to remember as a social worker working particularly with um, alienated, uh, um, coerced clients. You know, the involuntary client that others don't really want to work with, that may have re rejected, been rejected, that probably have a terrible kind of treatment history. Right? Systems theory reminds us that the outcome is not foredained. Now, what I think is pretty neat is there's also this concept of equifinality that's a part of systems theory. And let's break the word down again. Equa means same here, or comparable, equivalent, final point. And the notion here is that at any point, two different systems with different kinds of structures could potentially result in the same kind of outcome. Right. So Buffy comes from a really, really fine, progressive school from an extraordinarily rich tax base. And Bronco comes from a school that can barely keep brick and mortar together in uh, a, a distant, rural, impoverished environment. And yet, they come to the same college and they both do equally well. Okay? Buffy and Bronco. Who then marry. <laughs> and have little children. What a happy story General Systems offers us. Okay? Now what that also means is that when you put multifinality and equifinality together in terms of the adaptive or change capabilities that exist within a systems perspective, can you begin to get a sense of how absolutely dynamic and potentially unpredictable particular outcomes might be? It begins to put, again, the kind of traditional Western conventions that are so characteristic of the positivist approach to science kind of on its ear. Question so far. <coughs> How much of this is strictly review? How much of this is, wow, I'm glad we're having this review? How much of this is new? I don't even hear a cricket. The details are new? Okay, yeah. The grand, the grand concepts you've heard about, right? But now we're starting to fill them in with some more substantive kind of stuff? Excellent. 
Excellent. It's exactly the point of this whole lecture in this class today. It's exactly very good. Very glad to hear that. And so you've probably also heard of the term negentropy, right? Maybe not. No, this, this was a new concept, huh? Okay. Negentropy speaks to structure and the maintenance of structure. Structure that's maintained over time. And that's what this slide attempts to depict. Let this rectangle in its dimensionality and its color represent the system and its essential characteristics. The arrow suggesting time and events over time. Here the system has preserved, been preserved. It continues to preserve itself. It continues to preserve itself. All right. Now, neg entropy or negative entropy. What's entropy then? If this is negative entropy, what's entropy? That's entropy, right? Yeah, that's a dramatic slide. That's a system deteriorating, decaying over time. That's systemness being lost, systemic continuity being lost over time. And you know what's replacing it? Well, it's entropy. Because entropy, it, chaos. Entropy is loss or lack of order. In the end, entropy is a kind of homogeneous broth, right? I'm going to take you from neg entropy to entropy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, if we had, okay, we'll do this. We're not going to do this. Next week, all right, everybody bring a fruit, okay? A banana. Who, did you have the grapes? Who had the grapes? Somebody had to bring some more grapes. Who wants to bring a watermelon? Watermelon? Who wants to bring a peach, right? Who wants to bring a papaya? What fruit would you like to bring? You ever have a star fruit? Did you ever try those things? They're pretty interesting, okay? All right. Somebody wants to bring a strawberry. Everybody will bring a different fruit, right? And we'll all show our fruits, right? They'll all have their own dimensionality. They'll all have their own systemness. We'll show a fruit at the beginning of the class, and we'll show a fruit five minutes later. It'll look the same, right? Your peach will look the same now as it does five minutes from now kind of thing. But then, at the end of class, we're going to go over to the nearest wastebasket, and we're going to carefully deposit our fruit there. And over the next several months, we're going to revisit that waste paper basket, and we're going to watch what happens to our distinct, separate, identifiable fruits. What's going to happen? What are we going to be left with come late May? We have mold, yeah. When we get past the mold, down to where the fruit itself is, what are we going to find? For the most part, we're going to find an homogeneous liquid or soup stew, kind of fruit soup down there, where, where, where at one point this was the peach, and this was the apple, we're not going to be able to differentiate peach from apple at all. It's all going to be sameness. That's entropy. It's a lack of differentiation. It's a lack of structure. All right? and, and, and here's the sad kind of thing, uh, if I introduce my own value position to this. Systems theory posits that all systems tend toward entropy. Said differently, this, negentropy, is harder than this. No matter how much you struggle to achieve this, eventually you'll experience this. Now again, systems theory doesn't argue that this is good or bad. It simply posits that it is. All systems tend toward entropy. Let me ask you this, is it easier to learn or easier to forget? Forget, yeah, yeah, yeah. Neg entropy is, you know, pushing that rock up a slope. Entropy is letting that rock just slide right back down. So systems burn energy. It takes effort 
to maintain systems, even more to grow systems, if you will. Now, a fellow by the name of Barian came up, I thought, with a brilliant insight from a systems perspective. And this is his quote, systems seek to export entropy. Basically, what this means is systems as a natural systemic force, a process, seek to expel the disorder that they experience or the decay that they experience that they can't otherwise accommodate. What are examples of that? Can you think of what that might mean in real life terms? Firing someone who's called a scandal. Cool. That's exactly right. Come on, let's get there here. There we go. Discharging a disruptive resident of a shelter. Refusing employee employment to a non-productive faculty member. I decided to put that in because I knew I was addressing you. I wouldn't necessarily put that in if I were addressing a fellow faculty member. That, that gets people a little bit anxious. Okay. Demanding special consideration to avoid the consequences of prohibited behavior. All right. Well, I know I broke the rules, but come on. You know, give me a break. You can lie for me just this one time, can't you? Huh, boss? Kind of thing, All right? Have you seen Dr. Reith? You know who Dr. Reith is, our BSW director in the program, in the department? His office is up on the second floor of Lyle House. He has a quote. He's out of the University of Georgia. That's where he got his doctorate, which is interesting because the quote that he has on his door, I first saw when I was visiting a friend who was a faculty member at the University of Georgia, quote, Failure to plan on your part does not constitute an emergency on mine, end quote. I love that quote, right? But think of what that is. And many times, again, we're thinking in terms of a faculty-student kind of thing. I've been a student. I understand what that means. means, professor, look, give me an extra week on this paper, right? I know I should have been in class, but I was at the beach. But I'll do a great job for you. Now, if the professor says yes, right, hot damn, right, I get to go off and do my paper now. I've exported the entropy that I was experiencing in my life, right? But how does the professor now deal with that in terms of being equitable with other, with other students or in terms of the emotional consequence of saying, well, this is my policy, I've announced it to everybody, I've told everybody I'm going to be consistent and fair, and now I've just made an, an incredible exception for this person. The environment now absorbing that entropy will probably be affected by it to some extent, right? The more immediate, the suprasystem, right? The more potent, the entropy discharged, the greater the consequence to that suprasystem. But entropy is entropy. It's got to be accounted for. There's a continuity of matter here, if you will. It, you export entropy to the environment, it doesn't just disappear. Somebody else or something else will have to accommodate to it, will have to be accountable for it. But Berrien's insight that systems seek to export entropy is absolutely important, particularly in our profession. Because so many of the clients with whom we work have used as a basic strategy in their life the efforts to export the entropy that they experience or they create to others. That's not helpful for them in the long run, it's certainly not helpful for the others around them. Right? And so many of the times, even with the best of motivation, as caring, committed social workers in an organization that doesn't necessarily function, that doesn't necessarily adhere to the same priorities or codes of ethics that we do in our profession, how many times might we go to our supervisor and say, make this exception on behalf of this client. Let's do something special for this particular individual, right? And what we're asking that, that supervisor to do is to absorb, if you will, the entropy that we're projecting out onto a system that isn't prepared, that hasn't been built to do that. Now, whether that's good that we do that, whether that's bad that we do that is irrelevant. 
from understanding that from a systems perspective, that's what's happening here. Give me some more examples of systems seeking to export entropy. Make it as personal as you can that you're comfortable with. I don't want to hear the real stuff. Uh, in the MSW, if you um, make the loan be legal, you'll be at the legal or you won't be in the program. Yeah. Th there is a sense of that. There is a sense of that, yeah. There's actually, the it's a little bit different than that, but the basic thing that you're getting to is that, yeah, that here we have, let's say, an individual who's performing in ways that the system's not built to accept, right? And so the, re the, the result of that is to discharge the individual from the program. That's exactly right, from a systemic perspective. Mm -hmm. Have any of you raised teenagers? All right. Did you ever really want to just throw that kid right out on the keister, right? You probably didn't do that. But the motive to do that, that's exporting entropy out into the front porch at the very least. <laughs> Say again? Actually, that is a way of doing it, but in terms of the community exporting it, um, I, there might even be a way of thinking of that as the community containing it as well that instead it's built a different system within the society, within the culture, that is built to accommodate that kind of entropy. But when, when Castro in the, uh, uh, do you remember the, under the Carter administration, some of you might not even been alive at that period of time, but there was a massive migration that he permitted of citizens from Cuba into Florida, but he made a point of making sure that he emptied the prisons, basically, in Cuba. He emptied his uh, mental institutions as well. And onto the United States soil came thousands of people that had been intentionally discharged, along with the people who were simply trying to come into America to be with their expatriate uh, uh, family members. That would be an example, perhaps, of a system exporting entropy. And it would be an example, if you could listen closely enough, of hearing Fidel Castro just laugh is probably deep, deep, gut-wrenching laughter is, is how he handled that kind of thing. If you ever have a chance to do some reading about that or particularly talk with any of the people who were at the displaced persons camps that the United States then created to try to contain the, the um, disruptive elements that came with that. It's a very eye-opening uh, uh, experience to read about that. Here's your black box model. And you had alluded to this uh, a while back. And here we're coming up with some other key concepts. Input, the things that go into a system through its permeable boundaries. Throughput refers to the transformations that take place Transfer, transformations of or on those, those inputs, the resources that have been inputted, the use of perhaps inputs to, to energize that, those transformations, and then two different kinds of outputs. One that's a fairly conventional one. It's something discharged back out into the environment. It may be an intended product. It may be some kind of waste. It may be some kind of surplus, but it's being discharged back into the environment. But then there's a special kind of feedback that also is input, excuse me, feedback. There's a special kind of output that is also input. That's called feedback. Now, what's going on right now for me represents a kind of feedback. I can hear myself talk to you. So even as I'm talking to you, I can hear my voice, so I'm talking to you, output, but I'm also hearing my voice, that's also input, that's a kind of feedback. All right. This is the so-called black box model of systems. The emphasis here, frankly, is upon inputs and outputs. The notion here, the reason it's called a black box, you don't have to necessarily look to see what's going on inside the box. 
you know that there's some kind of transformational process going on here and that there are different kinds of outputs that are coming out. B.F. Skinner kind of stuff, you know. Um, there'll be certain kind of inputs. These will be different kinds of reinforcement, for example. We don't necessarily need to know how the mind is processing all that kind of stuff. We just know that now behavior becomes more predictable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also with um, jails and prisons, mm -hmm. very much so, you know. Um, we'll input these individuals into these facilities. We don't really care too much about the throughput there. In fact, um, the fact that they happen to be in there might be the central purpose for many people behind that particular kind of system. Now, when they are discharged later on, we want them to be compliant citizens within the community. We don't want them to recycle back into it later on, but we know that that happens with recidiv recidivism a lot. You know. Unfortunately, a lot of times this is also characteristic of human services in general. We may not know really in a detailed way why it is that something works. And there's a lot of literature to suggest that. You're probably familiar with become so with the literature on various psychotherapeutic interventions for people with regard to a whole wide variety of emotional psychiatric maladies, right? And the research now seems to show that, uh, that as you begin to partition statistically um, the contribution of different elements to a therapeutic in, uh, uh, relationship and a therapeutic intervention, the thing that seems to account for as much or if not more of the explanatory power of anything is the quality of the relationship between the therapist and the client. So you might be using cognitive behavioral approach, you might be using hypnotherapy, you might be using any of a wide variety of psychoanalysis or a wide variety of other kind of, of therapeutic approaches, right? So, so other than the fact that relationship seems to count for a great deal, right? There are probably other elements of the specific psychotherapies that also work, but we're not necessarily sure what they are. Right? But you know something? Again, we know that there are people in distress that are going into this process. We know that a number of them are coming out feeling a lot better, doing a lot better. That's the important thing. And communities many times are willing to support those kind of activities, even if we don't really understand in a specific way what's going on here with the throughput. Now, this is going to be the most complicated part of the whole thing. Having talked about feedback, this depicts two different kinds of feedback. Positive feedback and negative feedback. Now, I'm going to anticipate the very next slide I have for you. Positive and negative are not value terms in general systems perspective. They're directional. They're directional. Just like positive and negative correlation in statistics, is a positive correlation better than a negative correlation? No, it's not. It just means a positive correlation is this hand goes up, this hand goes up. A negative correlation would be as this hand goes up, this hand goes down. One's not better than the other. It just speaks to different directions. Now, how do we know what direction these things are? From a general systems perspective, Feedback refers to the effect of information on whether you move away from an original goal or toward an original goal. Away from a goal or toward a goal. All right. Here, we see the feedback amplifying deviation from the goal. That's defined as positive feedback. It's not better, it's not worse, it's simply directional. It's increasing, it's amplifying deviation from the goal. Here, we see the amplification, or we see the deviation decreasing, right? It's converging on a goal. So by definition, this is negative feedback. 
It seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? Yeah, I will, because it does, it does appear to be counterintuitive. Remember, feedback refers to two things. It refers to output that then becomes input. But we differentiate it positively or negative, positive or negative, based upon whether the deviation from the goal increases, in which case we refer to it as positive feedback, or whether it decreases, deviation from the goal decreases, in which case we refer to it as negative feedback. We tend to think that our goals are wise and that as we converge on the goal, that being our goal, our purpose, that to experience that would be a good thing. But we're referring to it as negative feedback. Again, systems theory is using these terms as directional terms, not as value-laden terms. And almost nobody uses feedback in this way, right? Have any of you ever heard, or to your knowledge, ever read anybody using the terms feedback in this way, positive or negative feedback? All the literature on general systems theory that I've read, and I'll bet you there have only been three or four articles apart from general systems theory articles where the authors use these terms in ways that are consistent with the theory. Most of the time, they're using positive and negative feedback to refer to how they feel about the feedback or how an individual felt about it, perceived it. Or was it positive or was it negative? Was it good for them? Was it bad for them? How was it perceived? That has nothing to do with the technical meaning of these things. So now that I've described for you what the technical meaning of positive and negative is, I'm not going to return to that again for the rest of the semester which also means I'm not going to ask you about it on a quiz, all right? Because it's one of these things where there is a technical theor theoretical literature about it, but since nobody seems to pay any attention to that, right, why should we spend too much time for it or have you experienced much anxiety about it? Now you know about a, an approach to understanding these concepts the way that they were intended, but the fact is, that, this is the last time you're probably going to hear that, you know? I'll tell you what, for the rest of your life, you know, I'll probably be visible on some kind of website somewhere as long as I'm teaching. When you run across an article where an author actually uses positive and negative feedback in ways that are consistent with this theory, why don't you shoot me an email? And I'll start to build a list of three such citations that each of you will have contributed to over the next 10 years or so. That's probably the frequency with which you're going to encounter that. Dr. Smith? Yeah. Would it have to be when the original goal is to stay on a diet and lose weight? Okay. Anybody have any experience with that, by the way? So here, here, here. Positive, feedback, positive feedback would be about halfway through, they're not getting very good success, so they change their mindset. I'm not going to be on the diet anymore. I'm just going to start exercising. So now they have a different, different goal. Yeah, or it could be, you know, this isn't working. I've got to change what I'm doing. Or, gee, I wanted to lose 25 pounds and by my cousin's wedding. Uh, it better be five pounds instead. Yeah. And that, that's all going to be, ready for this? Theoretically, that's positive feedback. We're not going to experience it as positive. But, but as a descriptor, that's positive feedback. On the other hand, I'm dieting, I'm exercising, you know, none of my clothes fit anymore, they're just falling off me. Every time I look in the mirror, it's just a wonderful experience. Well, guess what? I'm experiencing negative feedback, and I'm thrilled. I couldn't be happier with that negative feedback. Okay, you know, theoretically appropriate, it just seems wrong, doesn't it? Positive feedback refers to that which increases deviation from the goal. Negative feedback decreases deviation from the goal. No value judgment is implied. That's what's really important here. Not better, not negative, just descriptive. Yeah, and again, 
basically ignored by most people out there. Now I want to talk, you mentioned homeostasis a while ago. I want to talk with you about three different concepts about balance. We're starting to wind down here. Let's try and hang with us. The one is equilibrium. A second one's going to be homeostasis. I'll, show you, I'll tell you the third one in a second. You'll see lots of people use these terms interchangeably. Okay, they're getting their point across. But from a theoretical perspective, that's a um, simplistic approach. Equilibrium is a term in general systems theory that really describes a fairly mechanical, inflexible kind of balance. All right. If I actually were really good about this, and I took my finger off of this thing, the thing would just continue to stand up. But if I tilted it in any direction and took my finger off of it, it's going to fall, right? And there's really nothing I can do to change that other than propping it up with some other stuff or gluing it. But that we're talking about a different concept then. Here we're just talking about balance. And I've got to get that center of gravity exactly over the point of this pen. The point of the pen has to be precisely on the other side of the center of gravity of this pen and the center of Earth's gravity for this to stay up. And, and, and there's nothing that's going to change that, right? Any deviation from that, the thing goes over. That's what this slide depicts. A real simplistic, real simple, inflexible, unchangeable, very mechanical kind of balance. Now, by the way, that does apply to us because, and I don't have real fine motor skills, never have had. Gross motor skills are fine, but not fine, but not my fine ones, motor skills are not particularly good. That's what I meant to say. It's kind of tough for me just to stand here like this. I won't be able to do it for very long. And the fact is, if I tilt a little bit, I'm going over. Now, that's just, I'm telling you what's going to happen. You're not going to see that, right? But, but I, I, just like you, we are physical systems and we're subject to the mechanical influences of gravity and other kind of things. So equilibrium does apply appropriately to us, but again, in that very kind of narrow, unchanging, inflexible sense. Then there's homeostasis, all right? Now, you very, very frequently hear people use the term homeostasis when they're talking about social systems and other things. So I'm going to show you in just a second why that's not the most precise, perhaps appropriate conceptualization to use or term to use. Because homeostasis from this perspective really speaks to a complex but only moderately adaptive kind of balance. Right? You mentioned losing weight just seconds ago. Actually, that's what I had in mind with this thing. Because that's actually the experience many of us have with homeostasis. Right? Okay, so we decide that we're going to lose weight. We start cutting down our food, our calorie intake. Guess what the body does? It starts cutting down on a metabolism rate. You know, it gives us the big biological finger is what it does. Right? You know, oh, you thought it was going to be that easy? No. Watch. I can adapt to your reduced calorie intake. The body has those kind of biological systems and biological kind of programming that's part of our hardwire. Right? Now, you stay at it, or maybe you kick it into another gear with exercise, and all of a sudden you start to find that pounds are just coming off. And after the first couple of pounds, it gets to be pretty easy. It still takes some effort, but you're really clicking along. And you're thinking, hey, this isn't going to be tough at all. 25 pounds, two months, not a problem. And then what happens? Right? The biological finger comes back up because the body begins to accommodate in some different ways to our exercise routine, and all of a sudden it begins to stabilize around another weight point. Right? That's homeostasis. It's the ability of the body to create a new balance point, but one that change from that, it, it resists. Now, is it possible to move off of that? Yeah, it is. But we're going to have to change again our routine. We have to make it more severe in a number of ways, more, much more deliberate. 
And then what we'll find is that the pounds will come off until again, what happens? There'll be a new homeostasis that the body achieves and then there'll be resistance to change, difficulty in changing, etc. We might see this with metabolism. We see it with a variety of things having to do with the human body. But these different balance points are few. They're not um, infinite in number. <coughs> Homeostasis. Now, here's a question for you. Does that look random or systematic? It looks random, doesn't it? I mean, that's what it was intended to look like. It looks like a flight of the bumblebee, all right? Think of it as a bumblebee. Think of it as a flight of an airplane. That looks pretty random, doesn't it? Now, what if we were to look at that flight of that bumblebee or airplane, and we were going to now take a look at the ground? And there's your ground. Does that flight look all that random now? Doesn't look very random at all, does it? As a matter of fact, if we take a look at the distance that this bumblebee or this airplane maintained over the ground, right, over mountains and valleys and such, it looks pretty darn consistent, you know? These things aren't necessarily identical in terms of their length, but they're pretty close to one another. There's a fairly steady distance that this flying object maintained relative to the ground beneath it. All right. This is the concept of steady state. And steady state is a notion of balance that is very much a part of general systems theory. The focus of steady state is on maintaining continuity. It's almost redundant there. But it's continuity through change. Continuity through change. Look what's continuous. What's being maintained, where the continuity is, is in the relationship of this flying system to its environment. Right? So the course, the elevation, or at least the attitude of the airplane, whether it's descending, whether it's flying level, whether it's ascending, and what angles we're talking about, that's highly variable. But it's variable because the environment is so variable. And what's being maintained, what's relatively constant, is the elevation of this flying entity relative to the environment beneath it. Steady state. What if this were level of programming relative to level of need? If we were to go back to this graph, and this shows the number of clients served over a year, that looks pretty variable, doesn't it? If this represents the number of people in need, let's say in thousands, and this represents the number of people served, in hundreds, then that looks pretty constant, doesn't it? Steady state reminds us that it's important to look at the system in its relationship to its environment as a way of understanding how balanced a system actually is. Now, how does this relate back to complex adaptive systems? Okay. The concept of equilibrium is entirely appropriate when we're talking about systems that have no adaptive capacity at all. This pen 
has no adaptive capacity at all. There's no capacity for homeostasis. There's no capacity for steady state. But it does have mass. It is acted upon by gravity, right? We can talk about a balance of that kind of thing. There's no adaptive capacity here. With regard to homeostasis, homeostasis is generally a very appropriate balance concept to use when we're talking about biological systems, particularly systems where there's some limited, generally kind of like programmed capacity to establish balance with some level of change. But with steady state, the adaptive capacity is assumed to be extensive on the part of the complex adaptive system. Right. Very, very difficult to predict beforehand where those balance points might reside. And go back to the notion of multi-finality, the variety of ways that organizations can evolve in terms of structure or process or whatever. Right. And this refers to concepts that refer to uh, almost a single uh, set of events. As an organization or a system, a complex adaptive system, elaborates structure or changes its structure. Right. If we go back here, right, if we go back here, you're the one flying the airplane. All right? I'm going to ask you a question in just a second. You get right here. This is where you are. You got good visibility. All right? All right? What are you going to do? Your plane's taking you this direction. That's, that's a given. All right? What are you going to do? You're going to climb. You're going to pull up, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. You're going to pull up. You're going to scream. <laughs> ah! Anybody watch Flying Alaska, whatever that thing is? It's a great show. We watched that one, right? Yeah, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna come up. Why are you coming up? Right? Because you see the structure ahead of you, and so you respond in a way that's appropriate with what you're perceiving. All right? That's what this represents. Here's your system experiencing its environment and seeing something significant in the environment. All right? Well, what kind of reaction does the organization make or does the system make? It doesn't make a random one. Even if it can create new policies, new programs, new services if we're talking about an organization, this isn't willy-nilly. It's not creating something new just for the purpose of creating something new. The change that takes place here, whatever new that is created, whether it's a new program, a new procedure, a new policy, a new location, new employees or whatever, whatever substantive changes of occur are isomorphic to the particular event out in the, in the real world, out in the environment. That is to say that they incorporate in the organization's own way of doing things and creating things the central salient features of that event in the environment. Right? You see a big mountain ahead of you your reaction as the pilot is to pull back on the yoke, have the airplane climb, because you're perceiving something that's big, high, and massive in front of you, so your reaction is a systematically linked reaction to avoid it by climbing over it. You think you're going to dive under that mountain? Right? Might try it once. It's not a random, but it's a very systematic, Isomorphic, iso, same, morphic structure. Whatever is created here is a parallel to the salient features of here. And we refer to that process of mapping, as mapping. Again, the importance of the system in its environment. One of the most important motors for organizational change is what goes on in the environment. It's not what goes on inside the organization. For the most part, those are reactions to what's perceived 
as is or what's perceived as possible from the environment, right? The environment is your major motor for organizational change. But the organizational change isn't just random. Now, it may be competent or it may be incompetent, but even that which is incompetent is generally intended. Follow me on that? All right? People aren't just throwing up their hands. They're saying, ah, I know what will work, you know, even if it doesn't, perhaps. So what are examples? Developing a new program to meet a new need. There's your parallel, your isomorphism there. Adjusting services offered in response to the success of a competitor. All right. Adopting a new change technology in light of strong empirical evidence of its superior effectiveness. Okay. Gee, this seems to work. For others, we've just gotten that word, we thought about it, hmm, let's do it too. Okay. Change that we're making that is some way a way of trying to absorb, incorporate, and rationally, logically respond to the important features of the environment. That's our review. <coughs> Question. Exhaustion. <coughs> End of class. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>